I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Bowling Green Board of Commissioners for February 5th, 2013. I'll be inviting Police Chaplain Brother Joe Causey to step up to the microphone and deliver the invocation. I invite you to stand if you chose to. Thank you, Brother Joe. Can you join me as we pray together? Dear Father, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of everlasting life. We thank you for the privilege of being here tonight. We pray, Father, your blessing upon our city commission, upon our officials. Lord, we recognize they have a difficult responsibility and sometimes seemingly impossible. But we know that nothing is impossible with you. We pray that you'd give them wisdom. We pray that you'd give them knowledge. We pray that you'd give them guidance. We pray, Father, for every aspect of government which is brought before this meeting tonight, that you would bless those who are to receive awards, that you would guide them in their new responsibilities, that you would help us make the decisions that are in the best interest of the public, and, Lord, that you would continue to bless and keep all of us safe. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Cosby. we got a special treat tonight to lead us in our uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Retired Bowling Green Police Captain Brett Hightower, also retired U.S. Army, and now Law Enforcement Coordinator for the, United, for the Western District of Kentucky United States Attorney's Office. Right? Yes, sir. Thanks, Y'all sir. join, please. Pledge of Allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America. America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Brett. Appreciate it. Ms. Schaller, please call the roll. Commissioner Hill? Here. Commissioner Waltrip? Here. Commissioner Williams? Here. Commissioner Denning? Here. Mayor Wilkerson? Here. Um, Mr. Febo, awards and recognition uh, would you like to recognize there. tonight? I think uh, we have Operation Pride Awards. Quentin Hughes is here with us. Thank you, Mary. Mayor, and on behalf of Operation Pride Board of Directors, Commissioners, Senior Staff, uh, I'd like to make a presentation for Operation Pride's Commercial February Award, award and it goes to Kimball Pool, Pool Kimball and Dee at 418 East 10th. Uh, they did a marvelous job of renovating uh, an old historic building downtown and it looks fabulous from curb appeal and just a wonderful improvement for the downtown area. So with that. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the honor. Mr. D, we'd invite you to the microphone and make a comment or two. We have one. You know, being a lawyer and all, I can't pass up a microphone. And <laughs> with three of us here tonight, y'all may be running late for the UK basketball game at eight, so we'll we'll be brief on it. Um, on behalf of Tom and Phil, we'd like to thank the City Commission and Operation Pride for these nice awards, and Mayor Wilkinson, particularly thanks to you for your assistance in us uh, achieving this. Uh, this had to do with renovations to our office, the, the back of it, the side, and the front, the windows that were quite time consuming and, and quite an effort to get done. It took a long time to get it done and we're very pleased to be there. Wanted to pay a special recognition tonight to the contractor that did the work for us. He did the work, we just paid him. His name is Terry Hatler of Terry Hatler Construction Company. He had surgery today and could not be here with us. He is okay, but he had surgery. So his daughter, Emily, with baby Charlie and husband Tim, <laughs> are with us tonight on behalf of the Hatler Construction Company, and we wanted to recognize them for a wonderful job on our building. So thank you so much. Great. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Thank you for making the downtown look so wonderful, especially right across the street here. Thank you. Did you have, did you have another one? Solid partner. <laughs> Did you, there was just the one award tonight, Quentin? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, the only other uh, awards and recognitions we'd like to make is, uh, of course, we remembered uh, some retirements from the police department. Barry Rayleigh left us January 1st, uh, who was a master police officer and investigator for nearly 20 years of service. And we had some retirements effective February 1st, uh, both of which were called upon for extended military service. Assistant Police Chief Clark Arnold, uh, after 21 years, will be retiring, and Police Sergeant John Houghton, after 18 years of service, will be retiring. We wish them well and, and uh, uh, safety in their new endeavors. All right, Mr. DeFebo, City Manager, comments? Yes, sir. 
Uh, first will be a need for an exe executive session. Uh, Katie will read the reason. Pursuant to KRS 61810B for deliberations on the future acquisition or sale of real property by the city, but only when publicity would likely affect the value of the specific pieces of property to be acquired for public use or sold by the city. And KRS 61810G, discussions between the city and a representative of a business entity and discussions concerning a specific proposal if open discussions would jeopardize the siting, retention, expansion, or upgrading of the businesses. So moved. Second. Motion by Walter, second by Hill. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Williams? Yes. Denny? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Uh, Mayor, also I'm deferring my time to uh, Dr. John Long to provide uh, an update on the African American Museum. Dr. Long? <coughs> Mayor Wilkerson, the Honorable Mayor. City of Bowling Green and the honored commissioners and Mr. DeFebo uh, and to all, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you. Uh, first of all, I believe you have received our report and the, our reports actually, and you've had them at least a month, I guess. Uh, are there any questions you would have of me? Any questions for Dr. Long? No, sir, thank you. All right. Uh, I can read this, or if that's sufficient, we'll just the end. I won't waste the committee's time. <laughs> I won't take your time. Well, if you wouldn't mind, touch on the no. briefly on the highlights of it. We wouldn't ask you to read to. the whole thing, but just so to. that people at home would know uh, the work that you've been doing over the past six months. Okay. Uh, this will be for, we'll touch on first. I don't handle paper very well, although you'd think having talked for several years that I would, but uh, I don't, I'm not good at that. At any rate, let me touch on some of the highlights of the things we've done. Um, we had several things on our timeline that we wanted to get accomplished, and so as we looked at that timeline, uh, we decided to bring to the city commission here uh, the things that we were able to accomplish and so as is true of any situation we may have a hundred things to do we'll accomplish maybe 50 or less but we didn't have that many but we did accomplish a number of things uh, I'll make mention of the uh, period of time say from October through December of 2012 uh, we mailed out thank you letters to each contributor to the museum with an update of the year's accomplishments and projections for a 2013 opening Included with the letter was a receipt for the con contribution of the tax records of the, con of the contributor for the 2012 ta tax year. The receipt informed the contributor that the Amer African American Museum Bowling Green Area was a 501c3 organization and gave the details of the date of the contribution, the amount, a reference number, the check or the receipt number, the required statement that no goods or services were provided by the uh, museum in return for the contribution and offered the cautionary notice that the contributor con uh, consult and the, pardon me, the contributor consult the services of the Internal Revenue Service or qualified tax advisor to ascertain the deduct deductibility of the contribution. I know that some of you made contributions. You all should have received those letters. Did you or did you not? Yeah, they received. You did. Thank you. All right. It edited, reviewed, and accepted the pending final revisions of all of the policies and pr uh, procedures of the museum, except for one, which is the volunteer policy, a total of 11 out of 12. It is currently negotiating with the Department of Architecture and Manufacturing Sciences at uh, Western Kentucky University to engage building design and media design consultants. It is working closely with the department head, Dr. Keith Sylvester, to, Sylvester, to ensure successful translation of the museum's ideas and vision into a suitable museum space the successful integration of all media technologies into the uh, uh, proposed uh, design, the building of a detailed mock-up that includes projected future expansions and improvements, and the timely and successful completion of all contracted work. This arrangement developed out of a, deci a decision of the board to forego temporarily hiring a part-time special project coordinator, engaging instead the building design and media design consultants as part of the collaboration with the Department of Architecture and Manufacturing Sciences. Continuing with the accomplishments of the objectives of the museum, it has filed the income tax return for the period ending 30 June 2012. It's looking for, to engage the services of Ms. Laura Hagen for the intellectual property concerns 
and as necessary the services of the attorneys of the firm of Carrick Slivers Coyle. In addition, the board has approved the engagement of a social media consultant pending the review of the contract by its attorney. Uh, the board of directors continues to work to accomplish the mission and realize the vision of the museum. In the second quarter of the 2012 uh, year, 2012-2013 year, uh, of the uh, board, board members representing the museum received a donation of $500 from the Theta Alpha Alpha chapter of the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated at its annual Founders Day banquet celebration held on November 16, 2012 at the National Corvette Museum. And finally, to pick up the, a metaphor from the uh, earlier report uh, of the first quarter, we just may say that the foundations for the museum have now been laid. We are setting about erecting the superstructure. Again, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you. Are there, thank you know, you, are there any Long. questions you may have? One question I ask, and I'm going to put you on the spot. I know you brought please several do. of your board members here tonight. Would you ask them to stand and tell us who they are, please, sir? Won't all of you stand? That way, if anyone has any questions uh, and they know these particular individuals, they know who to approach. And would each of you state your name? My name is Eugenia Scott. I'm at Satan Ranks. Lauren A. Foster. Kathy Dunn. John Hart. Thank you for the work that you're doing. We appreciate it. Look forward to seeing it when we get open, too. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it very much. Yes, sir. Sir, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Any other, anything else? All right, Mr. Febo, did you have any other comments? Oh, uh, no, Mayor. Thank you. I uh, need to approve the minutes from our regular meeting on January 15, 2013. So moved. Second. Motion by Hill, second by Denning. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. This is the part of the meeting where we open uh, up for public comments. If there's anyone in the audience that would like to make a comment on an item that is not on tonight's agenda, we'd invite them to come to the microphone at this time. Seeing no one step forward, we'll begin with ordinance number 2013-1, uh, second reading. Ordinance annexing property by consent. Ordinance annexing 8.31 acres of property located on Small House Road near the intersection of Cape Hill Road with property presently owned by Small House Road Partners LLC and 1.56 acres of right of way for a total of 9.87 acres and said territory being contiguous to existing city limits. So moved. Motion by Hill, second by Waltrip. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Williams? Yes. Denny? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes, yeah, same extension. Municipal Order 2013-20. Municipal Order approving the promotions of Melanie A. Watts to the position of Assistant Police Chief, Matthew A. Edwards to the position of Police Captain, Michael E. Kiefer and Jason D. Scott to the position of Police Sergeant in the Police Department. So moved. Second. Motion by Waltrip and second by Hill. Mr. Febbo. Uh Mayor, I'd asked uh, Chief Hawkins uh, to come forward and put uh, his uh, recommendations uh, before you. Thank you, Mr. DeFebo, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you for letting me be here tonight. Um, before I get started on this, um, I wanted to touch on, uh, if I could, for just a minute, um, uh, what uh, the mayor had mentioned uh, earlier about uh, several members of the Bowling Green Police Department that are currently or have served uh, in, in uh, military deployment. Uh, some of these uh, promotions tonight are as a result of that, but I, I didn't want to uh, go without recognizing several other folks who are also serving uh, in the military uh, that, are, that are active duty police officers at the Bowling Green Police Department or in one case uh, one of our cadets. Um, we mentioned Clark Arnold, who is retiring or who has effectively retired several days ago. Uh, he's, uh, he was deployed uh, three separate times uh, during his term of employment with the Bowling Green Police Department. Um, Sergeant John Houghton, who is, uh, has just recently retired, um, served in active duty in Desert Storm, plus two additional activations during his empl uh, employment with the Bowling Green Police Department. Um, recently returned from Afghanistan, Officer Michelle Owens, uh, who was activated for about a year. Um, 
uh, Officer Jeff Gleitz, who is currently activated and uh, is serving stateside and soon to be deployed um, overseas. Um, and Officer uh, Jason Franks and Sergeant Todd Porter, who are both uh, short-term activated um, for some schools that they uh, uh, are required to attend. And those are um, a couple of months, uh, actually three months, I think, uh, in one case. Um, we do have a cadet, um, Colton Bill Hartz, who is uh, serving active duty and deployed as well. And uh, you mentioned earlier, and uh, it, it shouldn't go without uh, being repeated, and we appreciate him being here, uh, retired Captain Brett Hightower, who um, served in Afghanistan um, uh, and is here supporting his um, fellow officers tonight in, in uh, their uh, recommendation for promotion. Now, on with the business at hand. Um, I would like to present uh, four for promotion, uh, three uh, as a result of the retirement of Major Clark Arnold, uh, and then one as a result of the retirement of Sergeant John Houghton. And I would like to go through those all at once, if I could, please. Um, Melanie Watts um, is, is actually from Franklin, Tennessee, but uh, had the wisdom to move to Bowling Green at some point in her life. And uh, I've known uh, Melanie personally, actually, since she be, uh, before she became a police officer in uh, her former life and my former life. Uh, I knew her when she worked at Camping World way back when in the, the call taking center. And she used to, if you picked up the phone and wanted to order something from their catalog, she would be nice enough to answer it. Um, nice. She has, nice, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> she was hired with the Bowling Green Police Department February 20th, 1995. Uh, her first promotion to sergeant uh, was in September 10th of 2003, and then promotion to captain August 8th of 2007. Um, assignments of note, uh, she served in our neighborhood uh, response team, or NRT. Uh, she has served on the drug task force with Tommy Loving, um, representing the Bowling Green Police Department. Um, she served for a period of time in criminal investigations as a supervisor. Um, she also served for a period of time as captain in uh, Special Operations Division. She is a graduate of Warren Central High School. That's what's wrong with her. She is uh, a, a, a graduate uh, and double major from Western Kentucky University in both broadcasting and psychology. Uh, she has a master's degree in criminal justice from Eastern Kentucky University, and she is a proud graduate of the administrator's administrative officers course from the Southern Police Institute at the University of Louisville. She uh, is uh, leading the charge locally and statewide in crisis intervention training and she's the chair of the regional committee. Uh, she is a hostage a negotiator trained uh, specially for that purpose and uh, she wanted me to specifically note and for those of you who know John Stewart apparently John Stewart was one of her training officers early in her career and she says that she's still here following that experience, so there must be something about her that is um, um, stick to if you will. Um, supporting her tonight are her mother, Priscilla Stutz, and the most important man in her life, Johnny Watts. On to Matt Edwards, who I'm bringing before this commission for promotion to captain. Um, Matt was raised in Columbia, Kentucky and uh, graduated from Adair County High School. I'm sure that doesn't compare to any high school in Warren County, but uh, he did pass. Um, said he worked on a dairy farm growing up uh, uh, until he came to Western Kentucky University. Uh, and he actually was one of our early cadets, and, and Matt is an example of the success of our cadet program as we begin to develop uh, young folks who are interested in law enforcement into a career um, and, and uh, he worked as a cadet and certainly on as a, as a police officer and, and police sergeant. He was hired as a cadet September 9, 2001 and uh, then hired as a police officer December 9, 2002. Uh, as sergeant, he had the unique uh, experience, as a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, while uh, Captain Hightower was activated uh, of serving as an acting sergeant for a period of time, and he began that service in, in uh, September of 2007, then was officially promoted to sergeant in October of 2009. During his uh, time with the Bowling Green Police Department, uh, Matt uh, 
has served on the critical response team beginning January of 2005 to date. He is uh, uh, actually the critical response team uh, commander now. Uh, he served in the Residence Against Drugs from January of 2006 to September of two, 2007, uh, working with Abraham Williams in that role. He is our Citizens Police Academy coordinator since fall of 2009, working with uh, uh, other members uh, to include Ronnie Ward. He uh, is the Junior Police Academy coordinator, uh, and if you know Matt, he fits in with the kids. He, he gets along very well with them. Uh, both personality wise and stature wise so we uh, um, we, uh, shame, we, we allow shame, Matt shame. to continue to work in that role he is a driving instructor and does not require um, blocks on the pedals to do that uh, okay. he is uh, and and he currently serves uh, on the Bowling Green Human Rights Commission executive Bo board uh, since 2012 um, Matt like well, maybe not like everybody, um, Matt has uh, and continues to work on his undergraduate degree, but uh, he doesn't seem to find a college he can like. He, uh, he's been to Eastern Kentucky University, Lindsey Wilson College, and Western Kentucky University, none of which have kept him the full term toward his bachelor's degree, so <laughs> we wish him luck as he proceeds toward that end. Um, he has been to the Academy of Police Supervision, which is a, a, a specialty school at uh, the Department of Criminal Justice. He's been through our basic SWAT and the uh, National Tactical Officer Association Command course. Um, he's also um, uh, been trained as a driver's instructor at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Supporting uh, Matt tonight is his wife, Jen, uh, his parents, Tommy and Sharon Edwards, his brother and uh, his wife, Landon and Dana Edwards, mother-in-law, Dee Green, and uh, he puts down here that Brett Hightower is his mentor. and. Um, you probably couldn't find a better mentor, so we appreciate Brett be being here for him. Uh, I bring before you Sergeant or Michael Kiefer, for Sergeant. Um, uh, Michael was born and raised in Bowling Green. He uh, attended and graduated uh, from Warren Central High School. Um, also uh, has attended um, Western Kentucky University. Um, he was also one of our explorers, another fine example of the quality of, of people that uh, began their careers in, in the explorer post um, and worked their way up, up the ladder toward police officer, um, was a cadet, and uh, hired as a police officer June 30th of 2003. Um, during his time with the Bowling Green Police Department, he's been an explorer advisor and continues to be interested in that. Um, he is one of our uh, best police training officers we, were, we have up until this point. Um, relied on Michael heavily to help train the young officers coming up. He's been doing that since 2007. Um, he's a member of our Honor Guard since 2008, and most recently um, he is leading the charge with our, our internal tech team to help the department um, determine the, the best technologies to adopt as we move forward to, uh, to improve efficiency and effectiveness in the delivery of our police services. He has also, uh, which is a little bit unusual, but uh, prior to being uh, promoted to police uh, sergeant, has had the opportunity to attend the Academy of Police Supervision, uh, which I think will benefit him well. Supporting him tonight is his wife, Hannah, his mother, Jane, and his aunt, Kathy Dunn. We appreciate them being here with Michael tonight. And certainly, last but not least, Officer Jason Scott, who I bring before you and recommending for promotion to sergeant. Grew up in Cave City and went to Converna Independent Schools. Graduated high school in 1999. That probably tells your age, Jason. Um, he uh, puts on here, and I guess it's of note, uh, that he, he married his wife, Kanitha, in 2003. And then uh, he's also a graduate of Western Kentucky University which a, with a bachelor's degree. He was hired July 19, 2004. He is a member of our police um, motorcycle unit uh, since May of 2007. He's also one of our uh, uh, police training officers. We rely on him, again, to train young, new officers. And, uh, and just recently finished a deployment with uh, the Drug Task Force working with Tommy Loving for the last uh, three and a half years. He has attended the uh, DEA clandestine lab uh, in Quantico, Virginia, and that's a, it's a high-level training that teaches officers how to clean up meth labs, uh, very specialized training. 
Um, and he's also, as a, as a role with the Drug Task Force, has attended several undercover and covert training uh, trainings. Uh, I mentioned before his wife, Kanitha, is here to support him, along with his mother and father, Randy, and uh, Janan Scott, along with his brother and sister-in-law, Nick and Holly Scott. And uh, I would ask that you uh, approve the, the recommendations for promotion for all four candidates. Thank you. Uh, not quite so fast. I think we might have a question or two. Mr. Denning? Yeah, uh, thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Having had the pleasure and honor of being a member of the Bone Green Police Department, uh, dating back to the days of uh, horse and buggies and uh, no bulletproof vests and one bullet in our gun, it, it is an honor to sit here tonight and have an opportunity to vote on these distinguished individuals tonight. Chief, we, we have given you the responsibility through the city manager to decide what individuals based on other things that you have to look at to these respective positions. Uh, we have one going to assistant police chief, one to captain, and two to sergeant. Major positions within our police department here in Bowling Green. And in looking at these promotions, as I've had the honor to do over a few years, uh, usually there is one that someone has a question about. Tonight is no different. Are you sure about all of them? I did the best I could do. <laughs> and, and much like a woodworker with wood, you can only make the best piece of furniture out of the wood that you're given. And so I think I've done the best I can do given the, given the raw material. I understand, Chief, and I have all the trust and confidence in you, uh, but I just wanted to ask that uh, uh, about one of the individuals. I'm not going to call no name, but she's, she's <laughs> one of the ones that are promoted. <laughs> and uh, you've, you've satisfied me. Thank you. Uh, I think the mayor has, you have some questions? Well, I know the question you're going to ask the converse. Are you sure you want this one now? <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, all jokes aside, uh, uh, we, we certainly are proud of any of our individuals within any of our departments that get promoted, and especially to these positions here. Uh, these are the movers and shakers of a major police department. And these individuals that you've chosen, I know, are going to be outstanding individuals in their respective positions. Having been in some similar spots in the past, uh, I think is very fortunate and it's an honor. And it is something I'm sure of that hasn't taken place in other major police departments across the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We now have two individuals, two individuals that are outstanding uh, policemen that, uh, like the others uh, that we promote, has worked their way to the top. Uh, they got there by, uh, during those things uh, out there in the community that has to be done in police work. We are going to have now two assistant police chiefs that are females. Something that hasn't been done that I know of in the Commonwealth of Kentucky at the same time. That says a lot about our community but it says a lot about those individuals. And let there be no mistake, those individuals 
as well as the other individuals that we're promoting here tonight. Had to get in that car out there when it's 10 below, 15 above, when everybody else is at home. Those individuals are the same ones that had to go down and wrestle with the drunk that are in our jails every other week or every week in the case of some. All of them here tonight has gone from patrolman to their respective positions. And they got it the hard way. They earned it. Let it be no mistake about that. They've earned the spots that they are being promoted to tonight. And when you got to get out there and wrestle with drunks, drunk drivers, go to the wreck so when it's... Uh, 1045 or a 1046 accident with no one hurt, 1046 accident with someone hurt, which can be a fatal. All of them have learned, earned their way to where they at. And I, as old former Bowling Green policeman here in 1968 and a Kentucky State Trooper, I wish them well. It's not an easy job. It's not everyone that wants to be a police officer, but we've got to have them. In this country, we have got to have them. And I admire those who are able to put on a uniform, whether it's blue, gray, or in the case of Cincinnati Police Department, which I do not understand why they wear white shirts. <laughs> I'm proud of them. Thank you, Mayor. I know all of us on the commission congratulate uh, Melanie Watts, Matt Edwards, Jason Scott, and Michael Kiefer. If I could invite you to stand so that we could let people at home see who we've been ribbing for the last hour. Uh, I know we've taken a lot of time here tonight, but this is important. You know, we've got the best police department in the state, and it shows from the four that we hired and sworn in uh, Monday to the four that we promote tonight. So congratulations to you, and I guess we need to vote to make sure that this happens, right? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Williams? Yes. Denning? <laughs> yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Congratulations again. I'm sorry I didn't mean to cut anybody off. Anybody had anything to say? Thank you. I know that you guys want to leave and go down and do your uh, pictures and pinning, so we'll give you that opportunity to slip out here. I'm sorry, I forgot to see if you had anything to say. I'm sorry, Bruce. I got carried away. I'm Pre sorry. Preach on, bro. I'll take. I'll take my money now. <laughs> <laughs> well, they get it from them. You know <laughs> <laughs> oh, me. Mel need my buddy. I love her today. Oh, yeah, it's gone. And Katie come throwing in this damn after closed session meeting. Am I on there? Yes. You think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Now, Linda, you should be ashamed of yourself. All right, let's continue on with Municipal Order 2013, number 21. Municipal order approving the appointment of Willis R. Leach to the Bowling Green Warren County Military Liaison Board. So moved. Second. Motion by Hill and second by Waltrip. Uh, this is a uh, filling the expired term of uh, Ray Lackey, who is actually going to retire this time. So, <laughs> any discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2013-22. Municipal Order approving the appointment of Karen Foley to the University District Review Committee. So moved. Second. Motion by Denning and second by Hill. 
this is a uh, an appointment to the University District Review. Just to remind you that we uh, removed the requirement for this to be a commission appointment, but it is still a city appointment. And Mr. DeFebo recommended uh, Ms. Foley, who agreed to I think she to would it. do a great job and would interact well with the committee and represent the city uh, well. And from the Neighborhood Community Services uh, Department, so it will be a good, good fit. Any other discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2013-23. Municipal Order authorizing and accepting bid number 2013-22 for uniforms for the Police Department from Bluegrass Uniforms Incorporated and Nats Outdoor Sports of Bowling Green, Kentucky for a total group cost of $16,178.70. So moved. Motion by Waltrip and second by Hill. Mr. DeFebo. Uh, our cadre of uh, police and fire uh, department employees, uh, officers require specialized uniforms and equipment. We went out to bid uh, for uh, police uniforms in this case, as well as uh, footwear uh, for them. We had three bids. We are here tonight to ask you to separate the bids and to award the, uh, the uh, uniform bid uh, to bluegrass uniforms and the shoes to net outdoor sports. Both companies are in the Bowling Green area. Uh, Douglas here, do you have any questions about uh, how the well the uniform or use the shoes or if you have a question? Any discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2013-24. Municipal order authorizing and accepting bid number 2013-07 for in-car video project digital video system from Coban Technologies Incorporated of Houston, Texas in an amount not to exceed $73,275. So moved. Second. Motion by Waltrip and second by Hill. Mr. Febo. One of the things we specialize in as a company is dealing with those unforeseen occurrences that come along every so often that affect our job. We're here tonight with <clears throat> Municipal Order uh, 6, 7, and 8 that relate uh, to our need to uh, re-bid uh, and develop uh, our, our in-car camera system for a police department. I would ask Doug, and he's promised to be uh, terse, uh, <laughs> to explain uh, Municipal Order 6, 7, and 8. Uh, Lynn Hartley is also here to provide any technical backup uh, any of these three uh, municipal orders. Uh, Doug, you want to come forward and give an overview? I appreciate y'all enduring my long-winded discussion earlier, although I thought that was important. Um, what we're, what um, uh, we're dealing with and, and what the next three municipal orders deal with specifically is our need to um, uh, effectively build an entirely new in-car camera system. We have a good in-car camera system that the, uh, the, the past vendor went bankrupt. Um, we no longer have access to their product. Uh, we no longer have access to their technical support. Um, we were incomplete in finishing uh, the, the in-car camera project. We have uh, all of our patrol, virtually all of our patrol, less maybe one or two vehicles that have been equipped. Uh, but now this system uh, is failing us in that um, we've, we've had to reach out to former employees of the, the uh, bankrupt company to help us uh, keep this system afloat while we try to establish a new system. Um, we did rebid uh, the product um, that we uh, felt was appropriate for our needs. We had multiple bidders on that that, was, that were evaluated by members of uh, uh, information technology and uh, the police department. Um, that bid was then broken down into three separate components of the same project. Um, one was a uh, uh, product from Coban, which is the in-car camera company. Um, one part of that project is the uh, wireless network that's established at the Bowling Green Police Department. That when the cars come into the, to the police department parking lot, there's an auto upload of the video that's on their systems wirelessly so they don't have to have hard docking of the equipment. Um, and then there is also a, a, a server um, to store and manage all of that information on. 
and all of that has to be reestablished um, as we move forward building the, the new system out. And so um, I hope I was concise in that description, and if you have any questions, Lynn and I will be happy to answer those. Any questions or discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2013-25. Municipal Order authorizing and accepting bid number 2013-08 for in-car video project net app storage from JBK Network Consulting of Bowling Green, Kentucky in an amount not to exceed $88,111.70. So moved. Second. Motion by Waltrip and second by Hill. Uh, no. Again, ditto on the next uh, two. Any other discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Williams? Yes. Denny? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. And Municipal Order 2013-26? Municipal Order authorizing and accepting bid number 2013-09 for in-car video project general purpose hardware software from JBK Network Consulting of Bowling Green, Kentucky in an amount not to exceed $53,573.86. Still made. Motion by Hill and second by Waltrip. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Williams? Yes. Denny? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of ordinance, uh, BG 2013-2. Ordinance relating to cable television franchise. An ordinance of the City of Bowling Green section of the Bowling Green Warren County Cable Franchise Authority approving extension of non-exclusive cable franchise agreement with Insight Kentucky Partners 2 LP. So moved. Second. Motion by Waltrip and second by Hill, Mr. Fiddler. Uh Since this is essentially a, a technical a legal uh, document, I, I would ask Gene uh, to speak to it, but uh, before he does, I'd just like to remind uh, the viewing public that uh, we have uh, started a new uh, service on, uh, on our, on our uh, website it's called Mythbusters and uh, I think there's a TV program similar to that in which we aim to explain to the public some of the misconceptions uh, about things that happen in, in city government and the first show believe it or not is dedicated to cable television so I will let uh, Mr. Harmon give an explanation of, of uh, this franchise agreement uh, yes, it is not exclusive, when, and we are open to competition. Any questions? <laughs> that's, that's the same questions we get uh, all the time. This is, we repeat it again, not exclusive. Uh, any other cable company has the right to come into Bowling Green and, uh, uh, and seek, uh, hopefully, a franchise like Insight has to, to provide cable service. Uh, I think everybody knows we have a joint uh, franchise authority with Warren County. Uh, so the board is basically the city commission and fiscal court, but we most of the time, like this one, we'll do things separately. The Bowling Green section will approve this, and then the fiscal court section uh, will approve the, uh, the same thing. Uh, basically, what we're doing right now is we're continuing almost a 20-year-old franchise. The franchise we now started in 1996. Uh, we've gone through two or three different companies. Um, it's still called Insight, but as everybody knows, about a year ago, we transferred uh, the ownership, the, we approve the transfer of the ownership of Insight to Time Warner. So we are in effect a Time Warner company, but they kept the Insight name. Uh, so that's still a company that operating under. Uh, for us tonight, our uh, franchise technically expired about five days ago. It expired January 31st. Um, the, the only thing we're doing tonight is continuing the franchise for another two years. Uh, and after that, we can go probably another two years if we, if we can get some th changes made or if we don't. After that, we're probably going to do something more extensive because that's going to complete a 20-year franchise term. And the 20 years is kind of a magic number for franchise agreements. Uh, what we're doing tonight, though, is continuing the same franchise agreement in place that we've had for the last three, four, five years uh, with no changes. Um, the last thing we did to change this a couple years ago, we... Um, about five years ago, I guess, we didn't make sure that we wanted to keep our, uh, we, we went from one government channel to two. Uh, we wanted to make sure those government channels stayed low on the cable system uh, so that people would be able to find them. Uh, we, we keep hearing some places they're putting, you know, the government channels or the peg channels like on channel 99 on demand, and I don't think that's something we want to do. We wanted those to stay on channels three and four. Um, but, uh, but other than that, well, it's pretty much status quo. Uh, Commissioner Denning, we will continue to talk you know, during this negotiation, we talked about two or three particular issues. The county, probably more than us, had an, had an issue with line extension. 
Right now it's 20 houses per linear strand mile, I think, with 20 structures. Um, they would like to reduce that because they have some subdivisions out in the county. Uh, they don't have cable because they're beyond that extension policy. Um, we're continuing to talk about that issue. We're not able to get any agreement to reduce at that time, at least for right now. Uh, we continue to talk with Insight about a Louisville and Lexington, or Louisville or Lexington channel. Uh, we've not had the discussion, I guess, about that in a while, but I'll follow up again and see where it is. But, <clears throat> you know, we, we've said a number of times, uh, cable franchises now are mostly controlled by the federal government and the FCC instead of local governments. There's not a whole lot of control local governments have over cable franchises anymore. Uh, we talk about rates. Uh, the only rates that we can approve are the rates for the basic cable service, which is basically the 20 or 25 lower number channels, uh, the, uh, the on-air, you know, things, most of the stuff we could get on-air without cable. Some things are not, like the paid channels, but, you know, the CBS, NBC, Fox, uh, ABC channels, PBS, uh, those channels are normally located on the basic cable, uh, and we do have some authority to regulate those rates, uh, although those rates have not changed here in Bowling Green, gosh, 10, 15 years. They, they stay pretty constant. Uh, we do not have the ability to regulate the rates uh, on the movie channels or on the other um, uh, packages like um, uh, ESPN and the sports channels. That's not uh, within the purview. Probably one of the most significant changes that's taken place over the last several years was up until a few years ago, the city and, and the county imposed a 3% franchise fee. Uh, the state passed legislation where now all franchise, franchise fees are actually collected by the state. Um, they then turned around and um, uh, reimburse, if that's the term, or pay the city. The statute said paid us what we would have collected. Uh, in reality, that did not happen. Uh, we're now receiving less from the state than we received uh, uh, before that legislation took place. There's been a number of efforts, I think, to amend that legislation, put more money into it, but state governments, like a lot of governments, they're not uh, uh, flush with money and have not been real interested in doing that. And I defer to Jeff. I think last I heard, we're still 15% or low or so, uh, less in revenue than we were getting when we had our own franchise fee. But, um, you know, again, that's not part of the franchise agreement anymore. That's uh, been consumed by state legislation. Um, so, you know, the main thing is a lot of people ask me well, why we need to do the franchise. Well, we still do have some language in there about, uh, you know, how they do work in the rights of ways, about permitting and taking care and replacing the rights of way they, uh, that they uh, cut through from time to time. Uh, and for me, the main thing is to pay channels. Uh, the requirement that they provide the uh, public and governmental access channels, the educational channels, you know, where they place them. Uh, the line extension policy we still have. Some places don't have a, as good a line extension policy as we have. Uh, so it could be worse than what we have, you know, for, for certain. But those are part of the three or four major things. Um, this one, again, is just for two years through December 31st of 2014. Um, uh, Time Warner is now by far the largest franchise, TV franchise, or cable franchise company in the state. They have all the major um, areas. They have Lexington, Louisville, Northern Kentucky, Owensboro, uh, Henderson. Um, a lot of those franchises are kind of like ours. They either have expired or are expiring. Um, so I think right now everybody's kind of looking. This is the first time anybody's dealt with Time Warner. Uh, so everybody's kind of looking to see what's, um, what's negotiable. Um, what we thought, you know, some places have actually expired. I don't think we thought that was, that was a good idea to have an expired franchise in place. Uh, so we were proposing from Amy Milliken to the county and, and me to you, uh, is that we go ahead and do this extension for the next two years. Uh, over the next two years, we'll kind of uh, watch to see what some of the larger communities like Louisville and Lexington and Northern Kentucky do um, about their franchise agreements to see, uh, you know, maybe what negotiation Ability they have with Time Warner to get other things and new things, technology changes as well. Uh, so we'll be watching um, uh, those other uh, communities uh, and maybe in the next, probably we will start this renewal again probably in a year or less. It's, uh, it's, it takes a long time. As you can see, we're expired now. It takes a long time to get uh, everybody to the table and talk about stuff and get the franchise agreements out and, and ready to go. But right now we recommend that we go ahead and extend the existing one for a couple of years. Uh, and then in the next couple of years, we'll start working on the next renewal. Yeah, summarize. <laughs> <laughs> the basic is the 1295 package with very limited over-the-air channels, basically. Yes. And franchise doesn't mean 
to us what most people think that it means in that okay. it becomes an exclusive and only in Insight can service it. It means the franchise grants them the authority to cross the city's right of way to extend their cable. Yes. Uh, and the other technical issues are really not something most people are interested in except the number of well, you know, it's service. Hey, we and that's we certainly the welcome competition. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I keep thinking, you know, I'm going to say it's public, I guess, but I keep thinking maybe AT&T may be our first shot at competition. Who knows? They're in Louisville now. They're in Hopkinsville. Um, I've not heard anything about them expressing an interest to bring the franchise here. But, but the good thing about, at least for them, they already have a lot of their network in place because they have poles and they have lines. Um, and, and that's one of the hardest things about bringing in competition and I always tell people it was two things. One, the cost uh, of putting in a cable system. It's, uh, I mean, Rick can answer the question better than I can, but it's expensive. We're talking millions of dollars to put in a cable system uh, with all the cable lines and the equipment and everything else. Um, and then the second hardest issue would be uh, the penetration rate of, uh, you know, Insight. Insight has a lot of customers in Bowling Green and Warren County. A competitor would have to cut into that, uh, uh, you know, be competitive enough to cut into that, uh, uh, you know, that program we already have here to bring competition. But again, this is non-exclusive, uh, and if anybody's got any success in bringing the competitor, you know, like I said, bring them on and we'll welcome them. Yes, sir? The only other issue that, that some, uh, a couple of people brought to my attention is uh, Insight is required to have a local number for local people, and uh, I've heard some that they may get transferred to another location. It actually happened to me when I called on behalf of someone where I was transferred. I don't know where the calls were transferred to, but that's a requirement as well that they have that local person. Uh, I'll go back and look. I think we do have that requirement. I'm not too sure it's applicable after hours uh, because I think they have an office in Evansville and Louisville, I think, as well. Um, so I'm not too sure we're saying 24 hours a day they have to have, to have somebody here to answer. They are required to have a local office, which is another good thing our franchise agreement provides for because some communities are losing their local office. Uh, but I think, I'd go back and look at the franchise, but I think you are correct that they are required to answer phones, particularly during a normal working hours here in Bowling Green. This couple of examples were during uh, normal business hours. Okay, let me check on that. We, well, we had that discussion a couple of three years ago with the uh, president from Insight. We met with him, and that was one of the issues that we brought up was the fact you dial 7820903, you get Evansville. Yeah. Well, I don't want Evansville. I want to talk to somebody in Bone Green. And even if you give the name of that person, yeah. they got to transfer you back from Evansville to Bowling Green to speak with that person. It was by memory's correct. I thought after that conversation, we were sure that that local number would be open, especially from 8 to 5 or whatever. But let me check my local manager. I here. do know that that changed when they put in an automated calling system. Mm -hmm. um, and the calls probably do go directly to an, to a call center mm -hmm. and then are routed back. Mm -hmm. But they, they have maintained an office here. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll look at that. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Please call the roll. Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Williams? I have to abstain. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2013, number 27. Municipal order approving and authorizing the mayor to execute agreement for transfer of ownership and maintenance responsibility of portions of State Street and Normal Street between the City of Bowling Green and Western Kentucky University. So moved. Second. Motion by Waltrip and second by Williams. Mr. Thibault. Uh, last month we had a show and tell by representatives of uh, Western Kentucky University about their desire to uh, take over ownership of uh, portions of State Street and, and Normal Street. Um, we heard the presentation. It, the agreement, as Gene outlines in the ordinance, uh, has WKU basically providing almost all parts of what maintenance means on the street. Our responsibility will be essentially to take care of the traffic lights uh, at the terminals. Uh, what's important to us as a corporation is to maintain that road as a public conveyance, which it still will be. Uh, I think there's representatives from WKU here. Hey. 
And uh, Jeff is here if you have any more questions uh, other than what we heard last month. Yes, sir, Mr. Denning. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I've got a couple of three questions that I, I'd like to ask. How you doing? Very well. <coughs> this, uh, is, this is Brian Russell. With Mr. Russell. Um, I've had a, two or three phone calls and uh, about our plans of turning over Normal Street to the university. Uh, if you would explain to me the intent of Western is to do what? To make that street more that pedestrian friendly? Absolutely. Okay. Which means in most cases, and I'm sure in this case, we're talking about a slower speed limit? Yes, sir. 15 miles an hour is our proposed uh, speed limit. And that's consistent with other portions or roadways on, on the hill. Okay. Now, by doing that, and and I'm sure we've uh, looked at it, the traffic coming off University Boulevard and from Sumter Avenue area, the subdivision, if you're going west, I would say, uh, the Sumter area subdivision, uh, more than likely we're going to be putting more traffic on University Boulevard to go towards Kentucky Street or to go towards the bypass, are we not? I can't make that determination. Uh, I don't think the traffic pattern will change much. Uh, we still have a lot of traffic on there today. I think the intent is to slow the traffic down, uh, provide better lighting. Uh, we've just had such an increase in uh, pedestrians and actually students over the last several years sure. that uh, the intent is just to slow things down, provide better lighting, wider sidewalks, better crosswalks. Is it any future thoughts uh, about once, if, if we transfer the street over to the university, of the street being turned into a one-way? No, sir. And that's consistent with our master plan, which is public uh, information, and it's on our website. Um, and we've got a 20-year master plan, so it's never been proposed that way, ever. Okay. Commissioner, we also, have, we also have a sentence in agreement that says it remain two-way. If it ever decides to go one way, they have to get commission approval. Okay. That's in the agreement. Now, the sidewalks. Are there plans, and I don't know whether it can be done, or, uh, I, I know it can be done, but whether or not it would be something uh, that the university will consider in their 20-year plan. Is there thoughts of making the sidewalks wider on both sides of the street? Yes, sir. Which way will they go? Will they go towards the street? They will go toward the street. And we've already widened the section between College Heights Boulevard and to the end of uh, State Street, or really at the big red wall that's yeah. in the corner. And we did that uh, in conjunction with the high voltage improvement project that we did uh, about a year ago. And that's very consistent uh, with what we would do on both sides of the street. Plus, we would like to put a couple of uh, uh, pull-offs on the side of the dormitories for buses so that the trap the buses would actually get off of the thoroughfare uh, but that would be on the university property side uh, of the of the right-of-way by uh, widening the sidewalks down in the lower section uh, that is going to make the streets a lot narrower no, down sir. there no sir uh, we're not going to narrow the streets uh, in this plan. The sidewalks would just go to the curb. Uh, and so we would basically start where the sidewalks are today. Uh, we are going to take those sidewalks out and we're going to take it to the curb line. Uh, what that does in that area it does move the little strip of uh, uh, grass, uh, but that way we don't encroach on anybody's property. And the reason we're taking the old sidewalks out so that we can get a very consistent and smooth uh, pedestrian walkway. That's all I have. 
Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Would just someone remind the citizens now what Western will be able to do with these streets and what they won't be able to do with the streets unless they come back to the commission? Oh. I don't know if it would come from Gene. Gene or that, uh, well, just a couple of things. Like I said, I Mr. Febble has already mentioned it. Uh, the main things we put in agreement is our responsibility to take care of stuff. Uh, for example, the pavement, sidewalks, asphalt and curbs, street lighting, street signage, crosswalks, uh, stormwater inlets, removal of litter, mowing, street cleaning, tree trimming, snow removal, all that will be removed to Western's responsibility for those streets. Uh, as Mr. DeFebo mentioned, uh, we do have language in here that they will remain open to public use and perpetuity, so these will remain public streets. It just Western will assume control and responsibility to maintain them. Uh, in response to Commissioner Denning a minute ago, uh, we did put language in here that says they will remain open two-directional and it takes city commission approval uh, for Western to ever change that to one way. But other than that, that's the basic, uh, basically just turning over responsibility to maintain those streets to them. Jeff is also here. Uh, Commissioner Hill, if you'd like to hear from the engineering point of view. Uh, talking about the speeds, um, it, it is a lower speed limit than what, what they're proposing. Uh, but if you think about it, if you drive through there today, the impedance that you incur with people trying to cross virtually the whole section. So uh, I think this makes it much safer. Uh, the city realizes, city as a whole still realizes the benefit of the road remaining open. Um, so, so anyway, um, although it might be a slower speed limit, you still may get to point A from point A to point B about the same time you would anyway. So. Yes, ma'am. Has there been any talk of training the students how to cross the streets? I really believe no matter what the speed limit is, they do not pay attention that they're crossing. They're on their phones, they're texting, they're talking. I mean, it's at the traffic lights, it's at the sidewalks. Has there been talk at Western that they plan on encouraging students? Uh, during our concepts? presentation, one of the things that uh, was really evident is that well, we we did not have any sidewalks before on the section of State Street up toward the planetarium. And we had parked cars in that area. And then we also had uh, put a small bike lane. And I say we, we the city. And, um, and what we were seeing was that we had students everywhere. Since we have been implemented and put the wider sidewalks, we are having a tremendous amount more of the students on both sides with the 10-foot sidewalks uh, we've removed the cars and we are seeing better patterns of our, our students, uh, which is important for all of us. I mean, it's just a lot more awareness. And then within the last couple of years, we have also implemented and put some, uh, I'm going to call them nice signage in the center of the road. It's highly visible, uh, which does give a heads up for the uh, students and it gives a heads up for the drivers. And uh, I think we've already started to see a behavior change uh, on that section of the right of way. So. I would agree they use the sidewalks, but I've yet to see improvement of them using the crosswalks. They pay no attention. So if you can do something to encourage paying attention, that would be great. Mr. Williams. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, this may be for Jeff as well. Um, he and I share a common passion about avoiding street cuts wherever possible. Uh, we've got some underground utilities in that area. How is that going to be addressed if, if Western is controlling this particular section of street? Do we have underground, a need to access underground? Who would be responsible for those repairs? How would that be done? Um, there are underground utilities along this section of road, uh, like pretty well everywhere else. Um, any repairs, according to the agreement, uh, Western will maintain all the pavement. So. Um, the utility company, of course, would have to um, do the, the repair work. Uh, West, Western makes sure that that remains in a uh, good order and passable and not detrimental to a driver or car or anything like that. Brian, I don't know if y'all have any long-term plans. Or well, one of the things that we have, we already have made transfer of the College Heights Boulevard section from State Street, uh, used to be the old 15th Street. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, uh, public utilities uh, under those grounds. And it, our, our procedure, we both have a before you dig, WKU, and we also do a city dig. Uh, one of the things that we've been working together on is what they call a GIS, GPS mapping system. 
And uh, before we implemented that, uh, which is managed out of the Office of Planning, Design, and Construction, Atmos Energy has uh, come on board with us and we are now mapping and helping them and they're helping us also with the city water, et cetera. So there's a lot of things going on between uh, public works and WKU with identifying where these utilities are uh, using highly sophisticated equipment and uh, we're starting to get those things put online. But the most important thing is call before you dig uh, and call WKU before you dig. And, and that seems to work very, very well for many years. That's good news. Good news. Any other comments, questions? Please call the roll. <coughs> Thank you. Hill? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of ordinance 2013, number three. Ordinance relating to budget amendment, ordinance approving <clears throat> amendment number two to the city of Bowling Green, Kentucky annual operating budget for fiscal year 2013. So moved. Second. Motion by Hill and second by Denny, Mr. Pebble. Uh, a budget is of little value unless it's managed and reflects the reality at the time. Uh, we do this through an amendment process. Jeff and his uh, staff, as well as others, uh, manage the budget on a day-to-day -day basis along with Katie and we come to you when we need to make adjustments that require your approval. Uh, Jeff uh, can take it from here. Do you have any questions for Mr. Miser or something that's particular you want to point out to us? We've got plenty of information here for us to read so thank you very much. All right, uh, please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Williams? Yes. Denny? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. And that's the last item on our regular agenda. Our next scheduled meeting is Tuesday, February 19th. And we have a closed session. I'm sorry. If, that, if you finish that, yes, I have one other ahead. comment. Uh, I'd like to make mention we've talked a lot about service. Uh, retired Police Captain Charles Hunter passed away Sunday uh, at the medical center. And uh, he uh, gave a tremendous amount of service not only to our community but to our country. And uh, we just want to express our gratitude, I know all of us do, for his service and uh, uh, pass along our condolences to the family. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mayor? Yes, sir. He's a former classmate of mine. Um, we attended the uh, old High Street High School uh, that was located down where the emergency room of the medical center is located now. Uh, we attended together up to the ninth or 10th grade, and when the school system in Bowling Green in integrated, uh, Charlie went on to Warren Central along with a lot of others of my class uh, at High Street. Uh, he was a personal friend. Mayor, uh, my understanding there'll be no vote after the executive session. I understand. Anything else? All right, we'll take a 10 minute recess and return for closed session. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs>